Anthony Lackabell. Vincent Lynn. Adrian of the Arts. Someone who infects everything around him with optimism and fun. With the ever increasing portion of our disposable income, of all of our disposable income, that is being gobbled up by wireless and data chargers, Tony Lacabara and a looser environment for ownership of the telecommunications industry could not have come along sooner. So I am pleased to welcome to our podium today Canada's newest post of the for competition, flexibility, and yes, I will say, above all, innovative pricing plans. This event today was actually the inspiration of my longtime friend and high school colleague, David Miller. Um, we grew up in Woodstock together, and the price of having Tony speak today was he had to make sure that uh, the Woodstock area was lit up which he assured me this morning it had occurred. In any event, as you know, Mr. Lackenberry is the Chairman and CEO of Global Communications, an emerging, leading provider of the next generation telecommunication solutions globally. He recently led Global Live to the next major wireless services provider position by winning the wireless spectrum auction. As Chairman of Global Live, when Mobile's current company He's helped to position Win Mobile as well as an innovative and consumer focused mobile company that will provide greater choice and future rich offerings for Canadians. The secret behind his luck, of course, is extraordinary tenacity and hard work. Mobilize was actually founded 12 years ago in 1998. Since that time, over a long haul, he's developed it into an industry leader. By tailoring its innovative technology to customer-focused solutions, Globalive has not only thrived, but become the player to watch in what is going to be an increasingly competitive global telecommunications market. Globalive has been recognized for many things in its recent life. Best management company, fastest growing company, profit, uh, for its, uh, by the Profit magazine and others. The one that struck, out, or struck me was its recognition as one of Canada's top 30 places to work. And it struck me because it seemed to me that it was fun to know Tony. It would be fun to make money with Tony. <laughs> but it's probably fun to work with and for him too. He is not only a leader of an exciting emerging Canadian company. He has contributed to his community as a patron of the arts, a supporter of the Art Gallery of Ontario's Galleria Italia, as the patron of uh, reintroduction in New York City, or revival of New York City, Tennessee Williams Cat and Hot Tin Roof, and a variety of other charitable and philanthropic engagements. He's one of Canada's top 40 under 40s. He's a star of the telecommunications market, and he's here to tell you where he thinks it's going in the 21st century. Please welcome Anthony Lackenberg, Chairman of World Life. I'm a U of T grad and an entrepreneur, uh, but I would like to get one more thing off the 
table as well. Uh, despite all the rumors, my name is Tony, and I am Canadian. <laughs> What's more, Gold Live is a proudly Canadian company. It's a, it's a company of Rishis and Nishas, of Marwas and Mohammeds, of Peters and Joes. It's a company that's diverse as this great country itself. It's a, co a company that was conceived just a dozen years ago from my modest department with a group of my colleagues at the University of Toronto. And it is one that has emerged very slowly and steadily uh, to become a leader in Canadian telecom. We've always looked for niche markets in telecommunications that the incumbents ignored. We had no capital, no resources, no connections, and we built the company from zero to over 125 million in sales in under a decade, rolling out telecommunications solutions across Canada. To call us anything but Canadian would be quite simply untrue. But that's the kind of fear monitoring that the incumbents would like to have permeated the Canadian market so they can maintain their anti-competitive hold on the Canadian telecom market. A market that's been under-serviced for, by Canadian, for Canadian consumers for over a decade, and one that's been hamstrung by a national oligopoly and a series of provincial duopolies. Take Ontario and Quebec, for example. We have an 80% market share held by just two companies. As a result, it's been a pretty cozy ride for our well-run incumbent telephone companies, Bell, Telus, and Rogers, otherwise known as the Big Three. They have entered each other's territories in friendly ways and cooperated and then worked on cooperative efforts where it made sense. They are very well capitalized and they enjoy some of the highest operating margins in wireless in the world. Practices that have been achieved through limited practices of limited competition and negatively impact consumers including long-term contracts with un unreasonably high rates, and silly, fictitious network access fees and system access fees. So what has been the outcome of their wireless reign? Today, Canada grossly lags the developed wireless world. While consumers in Japan have been enjoying mobile TV for over four years, many Canadians are still thumbing it out on 2G networks. Our wireline replacement rate is only 8% versus 21% in the United States. The average mobile wireless customer in Canada pays over 2.2 times more per minute than our counterparts in the U.S. Canadians have access to far fewer grants and choices in other nations. The incumbents would argue that there are in fact seven grants in Canada. They failed to promote that they own the four flanker brands, Kudo, Vino, Solo, and Virgin. And what's most concerning? Our penetration rate still sits below 70%, while the United States is over 90% and most of Europe is over 100%. Many emerging economies have, economies have also passed Canada in wireless. The stark reality is that, pen, is that penetration in Canada, in fact, ranks last in the OECD. That's right, 30th out of 30, dead last. Sadly, it's its customers who have been felt, felt the sting. The pay more, get less philosophy has permeated Canada's wireless market has driven Canadians to consistently demand more competition for close to a decade. And why does more competition make sense? When the Telecommunications Policy Review Panel issued their report in 2006, it stated, a world-class telecommunications industry is essential for enhancing Canada's global competitiveness. And Canada needs a policy and regulatory framework that removes impediments to competition and innovation. Obviously, the lack of real competition a significant impact on costs for consumers and businesses, and deeply important implications and follow-up consequences for innovation and productivity in the Canadian economy. The panel report actually helped facilitate the ultimate decision to open up the wireless auction to new entries in 2007. And at that time, I felt we felt we were very well positioned to enter the auction. We had a long history of building a steady, a steadily growing profitable business in Canada. But we knew that in order to purchase enough spectrum to compete nationally, we'd have to find a partner with immense scale, with a, a lot of operating experience in wireless, with a real ability to stay go to go the distance, stay in power, and of course, lastly, uh, someone who has a very long, an investor that has a very long-term horizon. In order for us to actually be able to compete in an effective way with the cable companies, and the region and the big common telcos. 
So we set about searching around Canada and ultimately across the world for a strategic investor. And we secured weather investments for Ascom Telecom as that partner. Our Ascom Telecom is the largest mobile operator in emerging markets. And with their parent weather combined, they have over 125 million subscribers in the wireless around the world. Over six times larger than the Canadian incumbents. We knew that Mobile could harness the global perspective and best practices in wireless from around the world that that type of strategic investment could bring to Canada. To bring wireless pricing down, to bring innovation up, to finally bring a new choice to Canadians. Our success in the auction catapulted us from the top of the periphery of the public eye into the center of the incumbent's line of fire. What ensued was a firestorm of activity surrounding one crucial question. Was Global Life, with its partner Rascon, Canadian enough to become Canada's fourth national wireless provider? <laughs> to me, it's an ironic question because many of the incumbents have access to an enormous amount of foreign capital to build their networks. Bell Canada was started by Charles Fieber Size, an American. The British Columbia part of TELUS, at the time BC Tel, embarked upon its major expansion in the 1920s, when it was owned by a gentleman named Theodore Gary also in America. AT&T, an American company, was instrumental in founding Unitel, which sub sub subsequently became AT&T Canada. And in his memoirs, Ted Rogers conceded that he, in fact, had run up against the compliance, against compliance issues with the foreign ownership throughout the history of his business, particularly in the high tech, high growth days. Frankly, the biggest struggle we faced as we embarked upon this large undertaking was in fact not operational readiness. The biggest obstacle for us was access to sufficient capital on commercially viable or commercially reasonable terms. And quite simply, the reason why we had to go abroad to find capital is because it's not available in Canada to the extent we require. The pool is small and Bay Street is entrenched <coughs> with the incumbents and their business interests. Other new entrants may argue differently, but let's, not, let's remember that other new entrants have not acquired sufficient spectrum compete nationally. The one billion dollar plus price tag needed to really make a real effort to become a national alternative in Canada simply is not available domestically alone. We had to reach internationally. So with the financing in place, with the network largely built, with a team of over 700 people hired and we're ready to launch, we hit a slight snag. <laughs> At the urging of the incumbents, the CRTC created an unprecedented process that led to a highly subjective finding that Global Live was controlled, in fact, by Horizon Telecom. We profoundly disagreed with that assessment, and did, as did the Canadian government, who ultimately varied the CRTC's decision and permitted us to launch Wind Mobile. Let's be clear we fit very comfortably within the existing rules, standards, and guidelines in Canadian law. And we're very comfortable, we're obviously very comfortable that we do, because we've invested a great deal of money upon that conviction. So, 19 months and almost $800 million out of investment later, when Mobile launched and brought first choice, real choice to Canadians in over a decade, on December 16, 2009. The launch, although highly known by consumers, definitely has had its fair share of barriers already. Despite offering very attractive terms, we've been unable to secure any major Canadian investment to date. Bell Canada bought out the remaining 50% of Virgin Mobile that they did not already own to shore up their flanker position. Bell and Rogers recently purchased Craig Wireless, $80 million of spectrum for Craig Wireless, WiMAX spectrum, to add the already incredible amount of WiMAX spectrum that they own that they're not using. Bell and New Entrant, Public Mobile, has gone and sued the government and, and demanded that the cabinet decision varying the CRTC decision be reversed. Although we have made over 100 requests to share towers with the incumbents, we have not been successful at sharing a single tower with any of the incumbents today, despite the industry camera policy that mandates tower sharing. But folks, competition in Canada is alive and kicking. <laughs> despite these challenges, we are already bringing real change to the wireless industry in Canada. Since Wynn has entered the market, the incumbents are already reacting with more flexibility and more choice for Canadians. Prices are being challenged and lowered, features and services are going up, customer service is improving. 
We have also taken a very unique approach to the market in creating our wireless soapbox and subsequently our community on minimobile.ca to ask Canadians what they would like to see in wireless. Instead of talking to Canadians, we've created a dialogue with Canadians, and every day we're getting more and more feedback and ideas about what Canadians would like to see in their wireless service provider, and it's helping improve our wind mobile offering every day. In short, competition has begun. And it couldn't come at a better time. The growth and consumption of mobile content is exponential. Content is increasingly on demand and heavily personalized. High speed non wireless networks, next generation wireless networks, combined with advanced smartphone devices, will permit Canadians to access content video, voice, data, and application services 24 7, 365, on demand, on location. So, in the midst of all this transformation, how do we create a globally competitive telecom industry that, that, that advantages Canadian consumers while fostering the development of Canadian culture? Looking forward, we believe it will take three major policy changes. One, we must liberalize current foreign ownership rules as recommended by the Telecommunications Policy Review Panel. Two, we must facilitate access to foreign capital for telecommunications. And three, we must move forward with a policy review on the separation of broadcasting content policy from telecommunications cherish. How do we do it? First, is simply to add more competition to the marketplace, which we are doing. But the prerequisite to competition is capital. Economists know this, and the government knows this. Companies like ours, like the smaller telecom companies and companies that haven't even conceived them yet, need capital. But not just capital, lots and lots of capital. If we're going to create lasting alternatives to the Canadian tele telecom incumbents and regional game companies. Unlike mining and resources, the Canadian capital markets for telecommunications are small. More importantly, the business interests of our large Canadian investors with the telecom incumbents make it virtually impossible to access the capital here in Canada to the extent we would need. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't have it both ways. If we want full, real competition in Canada, we have to be able to fund it. If we can't fund it in our own backyard, then we have to allow for foreign capital. <laughs> Access to global capital markets will create more interested and qualified investors competing to fund Canadian infrastructure projects and telecommunications. If we're serious about competition to provide greater benefits to Canadians, then we must let freer markets work. Full stop. And I would argue passionately that it poses no risk to Canadian culture, Canadian sovereignty to make these global capital markets available for telecommunications infrastructure. We must differentiate between in telecommunications infrastructure and Canadian content program. Ultimately, we want the biggest possible pipes at the lowest possible cost. The critical issue for the development of Canadian culture and sovereignty is what's running through the pipes, not what source of capital we use to build them. Would we use more expensive capital to build a hydro dam and pass on higher electricity costs to Canadians? No. Would we use more expensive pipes to deliver water to Canadian homes? Obviously not. Mobile operators should be able to build next generation networks accessing the global expertise from very large international operators, accessing foreign capital, and bringing all that expertise to bear on the Canadian industry. Finally, Control, foreign control restrictions should be removed and replaced with a more flexible structure that generates and facilitates foreign investment where that investment benefits Canadians and restricted where it does not. Mobileye endorses the recommendations made by the Telecom, Telecom Policy Review Panel made in 2006 and reiterated and supported in the Red Wilson Report in 2008. Both represent a fair, balanced, thoughtful responses to the realities of Canadian telecom. So, where does this bring us? Without delay, Canadian telecommunications companies must be able to access foreign capital to foster a competitive market. There are great opportunities to create and develop Canadian programming with the right policy framework. Canada can develop into a content export nation for the first time, export our content. Instead of always looking to protect Canadian culture, 
from U.S. and international influence. And foreign control restrictions should be removed and replaced with a more flexible structure that facilitates foreign investment without investment benefits being used and restricts it where it is not. I am very proud of Canadian. I believe we can do better. We've created Global Life with the belief we can do better. That we're on the cusp. And that one day, our telecommunications innovations will be sought and envied by other nations. Because nobody in this room thinks 30th out of 30 is good enough. I believe the standard we should create for these, these changes shouldn't be about, be about whether they're good for Global Life or good for the big three. The standards should be measured on whether they are benefiting every, the everyday lives of Canadians. That's what I envisioned when I created and embarked, created Global Life and embarked on this journey all those years ago. And that's what we will continue to build toward in the years and decades to come. Thank you very much.